So thank you so much, all of you, for coming here on this extremely hot day. And thanks for um, <clears throat> getting a little snug. Nicholas felt that there was more equipment than people, and he couldn't see anybody's face. And this is a bit of an intimate kind of video. Um, you know, it's not uh, spectra sound or anything like that. So it's much nicer if we are together. I'm not going to say very much. I'm just going to give a little background to this. Um, Nicholas, as you know, has been working on video poetry. There's actually a video poetry collective, several members of whom, of which are here right now. Um, last year, about a year ago, we worked together. I wanted to mark the uh, fifth anniversary of the passing of my partner, and I wanted to do a video. So I, I worked with Nicholas on a poem I'd written about a, a year after the passing. And uh, there we started with text and then built the images ar um, uh, around the text because it was saying a talk, it was a kind of narrative and a memory. It was both about the past but equally about the present and the future. Here we wanted to work in the opposite direction, start with an idea um, and go from image and generate the text afterwards at, at the end. And the idea for this came because I was lying in bed, as, in fact, I, for the last two years I've been lying in bed listening to the crickets and the frogs outside. And it's so rich, and it's so sensuous, and it's so beautiful, and it's such a uh, part of uh, what I consider to be my nightlife. And yet when you think about urbanism, when we think about the city, and we think about nightlife, we don't usually think about crickets and frogs. We think about neon lights and so on. So I was trying to think about what would, uh, well, how, can we, how can we do something about urban nature? How can we think about that uh, uh, as uh, something uh, that is both part of our urban experience, but seemingly, uh, both psychically and experientially, apart from our experience of urban space. So that's where the idea um, uh, you know, arose, and I, I then spoke to uh, Nicholas about it, and he was intrigued by the idea of filming at night. So that's where it started, and I don't think I'll say more. It, we started, we did one video, and then it just felt like we weren't done. Is there anything you'd like to add, Nicholas? <laughs> Thank you, Lata and Nicholas. And it's very lovely for me to uh, see both films on a large screen. I have watched them a couple of times, but on my small screen. Nicholas, um, yesterday, he was telling me how you exchanged, uh, or you, you, you used one another's lenses and you grafted a lens that belonged to Lata onto your camera. And in a way, it was that tool that sort of helped in in, in looking and in seeing and in, in finding. So I don't know if we could take the conversation from there into how you crafted this piece together. Yeah, I think I, I really like that point of carving, that I find it very, um, I actually brought it into light. Uh, and even though I guess it was very intuitive no, in some way, it's actually what in some way happened with the eye, no, of trying to carve. Uh, Personally, my, always my, my inquiries are related to how do we see, how, what do we perceive, how do we perceive. So within that, trying to build a personal poetics no? of the idea of the gaze and how, how, how and what we see, what do we leave out and what do we take in. Um, and particularly in this case, uh, as you pointed out, no, this thing of me encountering uh, ourselves, no? not only in terms of um, a same wavelength, but also all of a sudden there was a magnificent lens, lens there, a teleobjective no? of 300, 500, and I have the body of the camera, and that was also another way of meeting. Um, but maybe we can go later to the previous you know, aspect of how this ensemble happened. No? Um, and in some way, uh, I guess this helped also me in sitting in Lata's apartment or walking in Lata's apartment or inhabiting with Lata in that, those days uh, to see also ways, uh, how to put it, to see also how she saw things, but to see also how I saw things, you no? Know? 
using th that lens. Uh, and I know from reading no, uh, some of Lata's books, this uh, intrinsic thing of observing, no? and from the place of observing from your own room, from your own balcony or whatever, starting to, to think, starting to see it, starting to, to develop things. Uh, and w it's quite amazing, but that second Nocturne, Nocturne 2 is completely shot from that apartment throughout one night of just standing, sitting, putting the lens and carving no, into the night and see what was revealed in front of it. Mine is more a question of ignorance, but I, just to know from the technical point of view, when the words and poetry started coming up, to me, at one stage, I was trying to decipher meaning, but on the other side, they, they added to the, to the visual of understanding, not of the, not of the comprehension of words, but more as a visual. Was that intended? You know, they were almost like lights themselves. See, in the case of Nocturne 2, um, there was a sort of game of playing it also, well, the syllables you know, that are coming and are conforming words, the word, so it conveys meaning, but also resignifies with new sounds that can produce by new syllables meeting and producing other possibilities. It's a few announcements, so uh, if people are trickling in, they won't miss anything. Uh, before we start the next session where we get to witness Nicholas drawing together the threads of his experience of teaching in India, living in India and teaching at Shrishti. Um, and so he's going to talk about his journey uh, with pedagogy, what he encountered, how he had to think about how to teach the students, and what his journey has been. It's very, very interesting. Um, before we go there, I just, uh, this is also a happy occasion for another reason. This is a copy of Peking Duck Diaries. <laughs> this is the inaugural issue of our network, and uh, we, there will be two issues a year. And the issue contains something about every event that we've had from last August to January. And the next issue will contain some stuff from um, the next set of presentations. Um, members get two copies, people who've come to visit as visitors. Uh, if you wouldn't mind restricting yourself to one, we'd be really grateful, because we only have 200 copies and uh, we would like to also make it an occasion for people, uh, organizations and other people in the city to um, access this uh, and see what we've been up to bank of filmic logic that you were resting on or drawing on to make this uh, thing. But um, a while ago, I think I called, I said to Lata that her new book, Integral Nature of Things, had something to say about urban studies or urbanism. You know, I, I come from a generation of people who went to school when books like Delirious New York and um, <clears throat> architectural urbanism books that like this were coming out. And New York's kind of crazy um, rhythms and schedules. And somehow uh, I moved to India at a time when that was, uh, if it was delirious New York, then it's ad hoc New Delhi, right? I mean, this kind of interest and deep commitment to documenting and celebrating ad hoc constructions and all of this sort of stuff. and paying uh, close attention to the night myself for various reasons because some of the films that we've been working on uh, even though it is it it for us occupies darkness and it occupies the night space in some sense so i was wondering that throughout both the films uh, i felt that there was this conscious effort of staying out of trying to make something completely visible you there was a there was absences, there were presence. I mean, the, you couldn't ever figure out completely what. It was like you were describing how all of those. Uh, for, so for me, the moon kind of became like the antithesis of everything that one was trying to show, because that's the only thing you see very, very clearly in the night. So I'm wondering why the choice of the moon itself, whereas the rest of it leaves it in this blur zone where it, it, it goes in and out of things, it, it moves around, it, you see some things, you don't see it completely. 
it, it's open-ended in some sense. When I see the moon, it kind of completes something. So I just, I was curious to know why the choice of uh, ending it with the moon or what the significance of the moon was. Was it to do with the, with the, um, yeah, I'm just curious about the moon actually. Yeah, for me, I don't know. It didn't come as a question. It was always there. You know? So it wasn't a, a debate. <laughs> but I guess one of the things that maybe today brought me to clarity was what Aisha beautifully wrote and read out of. It made sense for the moon to be there because it's, it's also like acknowledging the ultimate, uh, our ultimate you know, source of light at night. That's only the moon. Blackout, and that's the only thing we would have, no? If it's not new moon and whatever. But uh, for me, it's related to that. And in terms of the abstractness that then becomes so concrete in that, um, facing the known, the spontaneity. So what do we do? We have this situation. Can we face it? Can we do something with it? Can we put our camera and see yeah? how we are without disturbing, but getting things, no? And and this diverse range of questions. And a very important thing of facing the other one, interviewing, getting away from your uh, own experience. That's also one phase, one thing I face that. Then, for the marriage, the girl was in the house, and she was also in the house. She was not in the house, and she Kochi, this was during the Biennale. This was uh, last year I began this project, uh, this lab called the Memory Lab, by which we were uh, in questioning ideas of, of how to represent memory in art artistic ways, no? in, in terms of art, uh, and thinking of how memory is represented, or what memory is, and what of memory to represent. Um, so the, what Kochi brought was, again, a racism of the idea of what collective means as opposed to group work. So within a collective, we were bringing the ideas of what is it that you bring to the collective? What is it that you're lacking? So you can't provide, but maybe you would like to, to gain or not. I mean, if Azim Premji can hire you with your inst critical institutional critique, then... No, 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 what I mean, I, I, it is also equally true that whatever the, ins the dominant institutional logic is, their subjectivity is not entirely formed by that. I mean, I went to university with the most uninspired teachers, and school also, both in England and in India, okay? But there are two or three individual teachers who stood out, and there was something about their pedagogy, I wouldn't have that word then, but something about the way they treated me as, the, and as having the potential to learn, and something about the way they practiced the craft or art of their teaching, that opened something in me. And I quite, quite often, whatever it opened, I was only able to recognize many years later. But certainly, that has given me un, un, unlimited optimism as a teacher. Because I think quite often, even though we have a critique of neoliberalism, we are also expecting short-term results. We have to throw it out, completely throw it out. Because especially, and that's why I, I like the idea of cross-pollination, right? I mean, you, you're pollinating something. There's a process, you know? Or you're throwing a seed. It may hit stony ground, or it may just nestle in the ground until the, the, there's the right temperature and the right heat and the right moisture for it to come up. And we don't know what that is. So I think teaching is an act of faith. Uh, if we have not been formed as automatons, neither of those, two, those students. And there is, there, every classroom has at least five incredibly hungry, searching, seeking kids. You know? And it's, I think one has to pitch and sing to the people who are, who are the connoisseurs. One should never dumb down what one is doing. It's, it's so obviously, his pedagogy of the self really works because he wanted to shatter the classroom and whatever happened from that hat, take it into the forest. And even now you're saying, you have people saying, you help me not just in terms of teaching, but in terms of addressing other questions. So thank you so much. Thank you all.